We have our second wonderful um, knowledge expert here with us today. And again, uh, Dr. Benzie Kluger is someone that we uh, heard when a number of us were at the World Congress in Portland. And so we're really, really thrilled to have him here <clears throat> to speak to you today. He is an associate professor of neurology and psychiatry and the chief and founder of the palliative care section at the University of Colorado. Today, he's going to present to us on apathy and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, as he did at the World Congress. <clears throat> Parkinson's disease is classified as a movement disorder, but in recent years, the non-motor symptoms have been acknowledged as components of this disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kluger. Yeah, so I'm uh, yeah, Benzie Kluger. I'm coming out from Colorado. And uh, I think this is a, a, a really important topic. Um, the title that you see here is a little different in your program. It's the Parkinson's disease. You don't see cognitive and non-motor symptoms, but we'll also cover apathy. But I think it's a really important uh, topic to cover uh, because these are symptoms that people around you don't necessarily know about. Um, so these are things that your physician, um, if they don't ask you about them, uh, may not know about. Um, and if you don't um, bring them up to your physician, there's a good chance that they may not um, uh, get treated. So my goals for the talk are to talk about the most common non-motor symptoms. And I think this is an area where there's a lot of confusion uh, that people oftentimes will have something, say a pain in their elbow, and they wonder, is this from my Parkinson's disease? Is this just from getting older? Is this something I have to talk to my primary care doctor or my neurologist about? And so hopefully we'll provide some clarity around that. Um, I think it's really important for a lot of these symptoms to have a better understanding of why they happen. Um, and that'll also help clarify uh, which symptoms are related to Parkinson's and which ones are related to other health issues. Um, why they're so important to know about. And I think the most important thing um, and a theme you know, for the meeting today is, is what you can do about it. Um, and I think it's really important that you come out of this lecture uh, feeling empowered to be able to talk about these symptoms and to be able to um, take some action uh, to uh, address these symptoms and hopefully improve your quality of life. Um, so important things to know, and these are kind of the highlights, is, is one is that people around you may not recognize these symptoms. Um, so that often includes your spouse and family. So when we talk about things like apathy, a lot of times uh, caregivers and family members think that it's because the person with Parkinson's disease is lazy. And there can oftentimes be a lot of anger and stress around symptoms like apathy. So I really want to make sure that we uh, come away from this lecture understanding that it's not because somebody's lazy, it's because of how Parkinson's affects the brain. Um, it's important to understand that these symptoms are really part of Parkinson's disease, uh, that they are not something that just comes along with having a chronic illness, but they're really part of how Parkinson's affects the brain. Uh, these symptoms are some of the things that most affect quality of life. Uh, one of the things that I do a lot of research on is fatigue, and fatigue is actually the number one symptom that leads to disability in people with Parkinson's, more than tremor, more than gait, more than anything else. Um, these symptoms have treatments, um, so it's important that you go away from this lecture really understanding that there are things that you can do about it and not to feel disempowered. And the last thing, which may be um, really important, is a lot of times when I'm doing a research study, we'll go through uh, questionnaires and we go through all of these symptoms, and a lot of times I'll get the response, uh, well, I don't have that one yet, I don't have that one yet. Uh, and I want to reassure you that just because I'm talking about something does not mean that you are going to experience it. And I would be very surprised if anybody in this room experiences everything that I talk about. Um, so just because you don't have a symptom does not mean that that is something that you have to look forward to in your future. Um, so the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, these are uh, well known and recognized. So they include things like tremor, slowness, and the fancy word for that is bradykinesia, stiffness or rigidity, and imbalance or postural instability. And I'm going to go into this in a lot more detail, but you can see that there are probably about five times as many non-motor symptoms as there are motor symptoms. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that, and then we're going to go into all of these categories in more detail. Um, also, if you have pens and papers, I'm going to take about 15 minutes at the end of the talk to field questions. So if you have questions that come up um, as the talk progresses, please go ahead and write them down, and I'll try to answer as many of them as I can um, at the end of the talk. Um, so, so why does this happen? Um, so we now, um, and actually over the last five years, we've changed our definition of Parkinson's disease to include non-motor symptoms. 
So we now recognize that non-motor symptoms are just as much a part of Parkinson's disease as are things like tremor. Um, and we've uh, really evolved our understanding of Parkinson's disease. So we now think of Parkinson's disease as a process that starts years, even decades, before people first develop their first motor symptoms like tremor. Um, and there's some controversy about this, but it looks like uh, if people have heard of this protein alpha-synuclein. Um, so alpha-synuclein is this protein that's thought to cause Parkinson's, and the earliest places that it can be detected are sometimes in the neurons in the gut or in the salivary gland or in the nose. Um, and so these are part of the non-motor symptoms that we see, and constipation, even going back as early as high school, uh, can be a predictor for Parkinson's disease later in life. Uh, similarly, loss of sense of smell or change in dreaming can predict Parkinson's disease by even up to 10 years. Um, so we think that there is this kind of preclinical or premotor phase of Parkinson's disease. And then as the alpha-synuclein or as this disease process spreads, it gets into the brainstem and we start to develop some motor symptoms like tremor or changes in gait. We can also develop some non-motor symptoms at that time, including changes in dream, changes in sleep. Uh, sometimes people will develop anxiety or depression as some of their first symptoms of Parkinson's. And one of the things that I always teach medical students who work with me is that when we see people who are in their 50s or 60s and start to develop anxiety or depression for the first time in their life, uh, that's usually a sign that they may have a neurologic disorder and not a psychiatric disorder. Um, and then as these uh, proteins continue to progress, they can affect other parts of the brain, and that's when we start to get into cognitive problems and dementia, and I'll explain what those things are in a little bit. Um, the second thing that's really important to know is that Parkinson's disease is more than dopamine. So we talk a lot about dopamine when we talk about Parkinson's, when we talk about levodopa as a treatment, but Parkinson's disease really affects almost all of the neurotransmitters in the brain. So Parkinson's disease can affect acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter that's really important for memory. Um, and I also want to highlight this because it's really important, is that there are some medications that block acetylcholine and can make memory worse. And the ones that I see most commonly in clinic are medications like Tylenol PM and Benadryl that can sometimes block acetylcholine and cause memory problems. And also some bladder medications like Detrol um, can have effects on thinking and memory. So that's an important thing to know about. Um, serotonin is affected by Parkinson's and is important for mood and can cause depression or anxiety. Uh, norepinephrine, which is also known as noradrenaline, is important for energy and may be linked to symptoms like fatigue. And melatonin is also affected by Parkinson's and is important for sleep. Uh, the basal ganglia, which is the part of the brain that we target when we do deep brain stimulation surgery, controls more than just movement. Um, so we now know that there are these loops or circuits in the brain that are important for movement, but similar loops are also important for thinking and memory, for language, and for mood. And we've actually learned this in part through deep brain stimulation because if people put the lead in the wrong part of the brain, um, it can actually cause very abrupt changes in mood. And so there's some interesting videos on the internet of people who, when the stimulator is turned on, will have laughter or crying or other things. And so these parts of the brain are very closely connected. And so the very same systems that are important for slowing down movement are also important for slowing down things like thinking and memory or language. Um, Parkinson's disease doesn't just affect the basal ganglia and the substantia nigra, which makes dopamine. It affects multiple brain areas. So it affects parts of the brain stem that are important for sleep and mood. Um, it affects parts of the cortex, which are important for thinking and memory, also for pain and sensory processing. Um, so we're really kind of expanding our view of Parkinson's disease as, as a multiple brain disorder. Um, and then the other thing that we're realizing is that Parkinson's disease doesn't just affect the brain, it also affects uh, parts of the body outside of the brain. And so things that are important, and we'll get back to this at the end, is that Parkinson's disease can have some effects on the skin. Um, so people with Parkinson's disease um, can have some skin conditions, including melanoma. And so it's really important that people with Parkinson's disease get a skin check every one to two years to get screened for skin cancer. Uh, Parkinson's disease can affect the eyes and the muscles around the eyes, and this can lead to some visual problems. It can affect the gut, and we see that with constipation. It can affect the bones. So it's really important that people with Parkinson's disease take vitamin D and calcium and get their bones checked, uh, particularly since Parkinson's also affects balance, and we don't want you to have a fracture if you fall. Um, it can affect peripheral nerves, so like the nerves in the feet, and this can be a cause of numbness or tingling or pain in people with Parkinson's disease. It affects the autonomic or automatic part of the nervous system. Um, and lastly, it can affect the joints of the body. 
Um, so uh, particularly joints in the hand, uh, hips, and shoulders can be affected by a combination of Parkinson's and by changes in movement in people with Parkinson's. And one of the things that I'd like to emphasize and that I think is true across the field is that we're trying to move from this idea of rehabilitation to prehabilitation. And so when I see people in clinic, I ask them to raise their hands above their head. If they do this, uh, that gets me nervous and I'll get them started in, in uh, physical therapy to try to work on their full range of motion because if you don't have that full range of motion, the tendons can get shorter and you can develop frozen shoulder or other causes of pain. So we really want to prevent joint problems. Same thing in the hands to do big full movements because if you don't get those full movements, it really does affect your joints and can be a cause of chronic pain. So moving on to some specific areas, so thinking of memory. So this slide says, I have a photographic memory. It takes at least an hour to develop. <laughs> um, and I, I like this slide because I think it really highlights uh, the kind of memory problems that people with Parkinson's disease have. And, and it's more like the gentleman in this slide versus people with Alzheimer's disease who do not have a photographic memory. Um, and people with Parkinson's, it's a matter of having a slower time pulling out the memories, whereas in Alzheimer's disease, the memories are really not getting stored in the first place. So the symptoms and the terminology here is sometimes confusing. So everybody after age 25 has some changes in their thinking and memory. Um, so there are normal expected changes as we get older and, and people can have and it's okay to forget a name, um, you know, to have a little bit more problems pulling up a word, uh, to occasionally uh, misplace your keys. So those things are, are normal and expected. Um, it's not uncommon that people with Parkinson's disease will have what we call mild cognitive impairment, which means that you have more problems in thinking memory than we would expect just for your age. And common things uh, that we see that is executive function. So that would be problems pulling out memories, uh, could be problems with processing speed or being able to think as fast on your feet as you used to, problems with word finding. Um, and dementia means that you have problems with thinking and memory that are so severe that you can no longer care for yourself. So that's really important to know because a lot of times people will come in, actually the, the example that I like to bring up is uh, my Jewish mother uh, every month will ask me if she has dementia and she can tell me everything she's forgotten over the last month. <laughs> uh, and, she, and she does not have dementia, but there's a lot of uh, older adults who are worried about ha if they have dementia or not. But, but just to be clear that if you have dementia, it really means that on a day-to-day -day basis, your function is impaired to the point that you cannot care for yourself. Um, so, um, so it's important, um, and people don't always know this, that, that dementia is, is the leading cause of nursing home placement now for people with Parkinson's disease. So dementia and thinking and memory problems are a big issue and it's a big focus of my research in Parkinson's disease. Um, and one of the things about non-motor symptoms and why they're kind of more newly discovered is that prior to Levodopa in 1965, people with Parkinson's were institutionalized because they couldn't move and they weren't talking. And so now we're able to treat people better and we're able to see the development of these non-motor symptoms. So in some way, the fact that we have dementia and they have these other problems is a, is a result of the success we've had in treating the motor symptoms. Um, thinking and memory affect almost all aspects of function, so they affect our ability to take pills in the correct way, they affect our ability to organize exercise, and it's also important because it could be treatable or reversible. So a lot of times when people think of dementia, they think of Alzheimer's disease, but Alzheimer's is just one cause of dementia. Parkinson's is actually the second most common cause of dementia, uh, but medications can also cause dementia, untreated depression can cause dementia. Chronic sleep deprivation can cause dementia. So there are some reversible things that can cause dementia. And that's another reason why it's important to get tested and to make sure that it's brought up with your doctor. Um, so things that you can do about it. I, I like this slide and I like using the analogy of the brain as a muscle. Um, and so the kind of basic idea here is that if you're not working out your brain, that your brain's going to shrink. Um, and so this includes being physically active and actually our best evidence uh, is not Lumosity or any other kind of magic brain game like Sudoku or crossword puzzles. It's really aerobic exercise. It's probably the number one thing you can do to help keep your memory doing well. Um, with regards to mental exercises, there's no magic formula. And in fact, Lumosity was sued because they claim to have a magic formula and they don't. Um, and so the most important thing I think with mental exercise is to find something that you really enjoy doing. Um, and so if you enjoy Scrabble or crossword puzzles or reading or you want to take up playing the ukulele, um, any of those things are great as long as they keep you mentally active. And then the last thing that's really important is staying socially active. Um, and so with illnesses like Parkinson's disease, there's a tendency that your social world can shrink. 
So you're not seeing the people you used to work with, you're not seeing your racquetball club, you're not going out anymore, and pretty soon it's just you and your, your caregiver. Um, and people with that kind of restricted social network actually have the same risk of death as if they had started smoking. Um, so, so really important to stay socially engaged and social active as well. Um, so it's important to get your memory tested. So I use the example of my mother as somebody who uh, doesn't have a lot of insight into uh, their memory issues. And in fact, when we ask people how they're doing in terms of their thinking and memory, that correlates better with depression than it does with memory tests. And we see the flip side of that a lot is that I'll see patients in my clinic who have very profound dementia, and when I ask them how their thinking and memory is, they'll say it's great, it's these other people in the room uh, that have the problem. And so the point is, is just that it's very hard for you to self-test uh, your own thinking and memory. And so the MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, is one way to do memory screening. There's also neuropsychological tests that can take about two hours that can really give you a good sense of where your thinking and memory is. And it's important to do these at least once a year to see where your thinking and memory is and see if it's changing over time. Um, it's also important, as I mentioned, to make sure there's not another cause. Um, medications are one of the uh, most dramatic causes I've seen, and I've had patients, actually in our palliative care clinic, I had a patient uh, who came in who was ready for hospice, and he was taking one to two Tylenol PM a day, and we took him off of that medication, and I didn't expect this kind of dramatic response, but two weeks later, um, he was back to his normal self and, and didn't, need to, didn't feel like he needed to go on hospice. So really important to make sure you're not taking medicines you shouldn't be on, to be checked for things like vitamin B12 deficiency, and really make sure that we're not missing something else that could be tre uh, treatable. Um, exercise, as I said, is important. Being strategic, what I mean by that is if we think back to that first slide about uh, having a photographic memory, uh, that people with Parkinson's disease can use their uh, smartphones, they can use writing and other things to get around some of the cognitive issues. And you can also be strategic in terms of exercising or stressing your memory. So for instance, if you're having difficulties with memory, you can go to the grocery store uh, with a grocery list and try to go through the store without the list and then hopefully remember to check the list before you leave uh, to see how did you get. But that's, that's a way to do kind of day-to-day -day practical rehab for, for some of your thinking and memory issues. And then there are medications that are specifically designed to help people with Parkinson's with thinking and memory and may also help slow down the progression of those uh, symptoms. Um, so regarding sleep and energy, <coughs> Uh, there's various symptoms of sleep and energy that we see in Parkinson's disease. So under insomnia, I kind of divide it out into people who have problems with going to sleep or sleep initiation, uh, people who have problems with sleep maintenance or staying asleep who wake up frequently during the night, and people who have problems with early morning awakening who wake up early in the morning and can't get back to sleep. Um, and one of the themes when we talk about sleep is that it's really important that we diagnose what the sleep problem is so that we get the right treatment. So the right treatment is not just giving somebody a sleeping pill, it's really figuring out why they're having a problem with sleep and then trying to make sure that we develop a treatment that will address that issue. Excessive daytime sleepiness is people who have problems where they fall asleep, for instance, during a fascinating lecture like this. Um, <laughs> and, or if they're, you know, hopefully not driving and fall asleep at the wheel. Um, uh, but that's excessive daytime sleepiness. And then fatigue. I use the example of people have uh, illness like the flu, you can take a nap when you have the flu, you wake up from the nap, you don't feel like taking another nap, but you still don't have energy to do what you want to do, and that's what I mean by fatigue, and that's actually pretty common in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, so it's important that sleep affects nearly everything, and there's an increasing um, push in medicine uh, to really try to help people uh, sleep better. Um, so sleep affects balance, sleep affects motor function, sleep affects mood, sleep affects thinking and memory. And so if we're only treating Parkinson's, and I have on the next thing, Parkinson's is a 24-7 disease, but if we're only talking about and treating Parkinson's during the daytime and we're not focused on nighttime, we're really not doing a good job of treating Parkinson's. Um, and the last thing is that these symptoms can be treatable, so there are some specific disorders and specific things we can do to improve sleep um, uh, that I think are, are important to know about. So some common problems that we see in Parkinson's disease, uh, so we, in medicine, part of medical school is learning fancy words, that's what I get paid for. And so we have nocturia is a fancy word for having to get up at night to pee. Um, and that's pretty common for people with Parkinson's disease and there are things that we can do to help that. Um, anxiety and depression can affect sleep. And, and again, when we divide things out, anxiety oftentimes causes people to have problems going to sleep that their mind is racing and they can't get their mind to shut off, whereas with depression, we see the opposite pattern where a lot of times people will wake up early and they can't get back to sleep. 
Um, pain, if it's not well treated, can definitely impact uh, sleep at night. Untreated Parkinson's disease is another cause of uh, sleep problems. And so one of the patterns that we'll see is a lot of times people will need their Cinemet every four hours uh, during the daytime and they can tell when it wears off. They take their last dose at 10 p.m. and all at 2 a.m. Uh, they're feeling uncomfortable and stiff and they can't get back to sleep. It may be that they need a long-acting medication or even medications during the night to help them get a good night's sleep. So that's a trick that I'll sometimes use to help people sleep through the night and sometimes we'll have a pill right at the bedside uh, that people can take if they wake up during the night to help them get back to sleep. Um, nightmares are, are fairly common in people with Parkinson's disease and I've had some patients who are even afraid to go to sleep because of their nightmares and there are treatments that we can do to help reduce those. And then dyskinesias or extra movements are another thing that can interfere with sleep. So if people are on too much medication at night, they might have a problem settling down because of extra movement. Um, also in Parkinson's disease, we see specific sleep disorders. Um, so restless leg syndrome uh, is a, a syndrome where people will have kind of a creepy crawly feeling or a restless feeling in their legs and it feels better when they get up and walk around. Uh, this typically happens before people go to bed. So if they're sitting around and watching TV or while they're in bed and still, and then um, it could definitely uh, delay going to sleep. Periodic leg movements of sleep, in contrast, is kicking your legs around after you've gone to sleep. Um, so that's periodic leg movements of sleep. REM behavior disorder, which stands for rapid eye movement behavior disorder, is the part of sleep where we dream, is rapid eye movement sleep. And normally when we dream, our uh, brain gets disconnected from our body. In people with REM behavior disorder, that doesn't happen. And so when people are dreaming about fighting crime, uh, their bedmate is getting punched in the back and, and kicked. Um, and oftentimes uh, the, uh, the patient will wake up and feel triumphant because they've uh, defeated Joker and, and, the, and the spouse is uh, feeling uh, unrested and, and bruised uh, because they've been punched. And, and oftentimes, again, this happens you know, even five to 10 years before I see people in clinic and people may be sleeping in separate beds or separate bedrooms or even separate parts of the house if people are really uh, loud or screaming and things at night. Um, and the last one is sleep apnea, uh, which is problems with breathing at night and it can be uh, snoring or even uh, complete cessation of breathing and then gasping as people try to catch up their breath. With these last three, the leg movements of sleep, REM behavior disorder, and sleep apnea, uh, the patient may not recognize that they have a sleep disorder. They may sleep through the night. They may even sleep longer than usual, like eight or 10 hours, but they may not feel rested when they wake up in the morning. And so with these types of sleep disorders, when I see people in clinic, if there is somebody who sleeps with them, I'll talk to them about it. Um, and otherwise, we may need to get a sleep study to really make sure we know what's going on and why people are not getting uh, a good restful night of sleep. Um, so things that people can do about it. Um, I think, uh, in general, sleep studies are really underutilized. Um, and so it's really important if people are having problems with sleep or if they're having problems where they sleep even a normal amount and don't feel rested in the morning to get a sleep study to see if we are missing a specific sleep condition. Um, second, it's really important to check medications. Uh, there are some medications that can cause insomnia. Um, in Parkinson's disease, some common culprits include amantadine. Um, and it's uh, pretty common that people take their amantadine twice a day. They may take it in the morning and nighttime, and the nighttime dose can interfere with sleep. Uh, there are other medications that can cause insomnia. Some antidepressants can cause insomnia. Um, exercise um, is important. Um, and people may have different patterns. Some people feel like doing exercise first thing in the morning when they have energy will help them and can help them sleep later at night. Some people feel like exercise later in the afternoon or evening can help them wind down. So it's just really finding a good habit that works for you. And then there are some very specific treatments that we use for Parkinson's. So if people just have general insomnia, we'll oftentimes start with melatonin. And as I mentioned earlier, people with Parkinson's disease oftentimes will have a deficiency in melatonin. And melatonin is really the chemical in the brain that helps set the sleep-wake cycle. So it is something that's safe to take every night. And in fact, in people who do take it, I recommend they take it every night to try to get them back on a good sleep-wake cycle. People can take up to 12 milligrams, and there's now a long-acting form that can help people more with sleep maintenance. Um, for other disorders like sleep apnea, oxygen, or a mask at night can really help with sleep and sleep quality. Uh, there's medications that can help with REM behavior disorder, including melatonin and clonazepam. Um, so we really want to make sure that we get the right treatment for the right disorder to help people get a good night's sleep and a good start on their day. 
Uh, mood disorders are common in Parkinson's. And I like this slide because uh, people with mood disorders, like anxiety or depression, um, it really changes the way they see the world. Um, so it's not like they just have sadness. It's really that everything that they do is permeated uh, by depression or anxiety. Um, so the symptoms that we see in Parkinson's include depression. And I think it's important to know that people with Parkinson's disease matched for disability with people with rheumatoid arthritis actually have twice the rate of, Park of depression meaning that, that depression and Parkinson's is really related to how Parkinson's affects the brain. It's not just because people with Parkinson's have a disability and are feeling sorry for themselves or anything like that. That depression can really be part of Parkinson's. Um, secondly, are anxiety disorders. Um, and there's actually three I'd like to mention. So generalized anxiety disorder is having a sense of nervousness or tension that just goes through the day and it's not necessarily tied to anything in specific. Um, social phobia um, is a fear of being around people. And again, if you remember back that I, I talked about how important it is to avoid social isolation. And so it's really important that we recognize and treat social phobia and that we don't just accept that somebody doesn't want to be around people because of their tremor or because of their Parkinson's. And the last one, which I didn't write down here, is panic attacks. So people can have a sense of panic, sometimes because of medications wearing off, uh, sometimes independently. And so with both depression and anxiety, when I talk to people, I want to find out if there's any relation to their medications because people can have fluctuations in mood, just like they have fluctuations in motor symptoms with their medications, or these symptoms may be independent of dopamine. And then the last symptom uh, to talk about is apathy. Um, and I think that ties, actually, I'll, I'll in a second. So, so apathy is a loss of motivation and a flattening of, of mood. Um, and a lot of times, apathy is confused with depression. But if, with people with apathy, they don't feel depressed. They don't really feel particularly happy. I think a good example of apathy is having, a, having somebody, and you can put them in front of a television. It might even be static on the television, and they're not going to be motivated to get up and change it. Um, so that's really what, what apathy is. Um, the other thing that I would like to mention while we're talking about mood, and this is part of our palliative care program, is that there are normal emotions that come up in the course of Parkinson's that can be difficult to uh, deal with, and that can include things like grief or a sense of loss of what you're not able to do or what you might not be able to do in the future. Uh, people can have normal worries about finances, about what's going to happen with their family. People can have uh, symptoms of guilt, uh, feeling that they're a burden to their family. Uh, people can have anger and frustration. And so these difficult emotions, I think it's important to recognize and acknowledge them and to not pathologize them, to not say that somebody, because you're upset that you have Parkinson's disease, that now you also have a psychiatric disorder of depression. Um, so I want to make sure that we acknowledge that people can have difficult emotions that are normal with Parkinson's disease. And the way to deal with those is not to give them medications. I have a slide uh, with the cartoon of a person that says, can we up the dosage? I still have feelings. And, and I think that a lot of time that's kind of our society's approach to difficult emotions is that I'm going to keep giving you Prozac until you shut up and stop complaining about them. But that's really not the right approach. So if people are struggling with a sense of loss, a sense of identity, a sense of relationship, it's really important to bring those things up and to talk about them. Um, so it's important, uh, just like sleep, mood also affects everything. Um, and so people with depression uh, will move slower. They'll be less motivated to exercise. Same thing with apathy. Um, I think it's important that people understand that they deserve help, and, and I put that there because there's still a lot of stigma around depression and anxiety, and I think a lot of people think that they should be able to tough it out, um, but, but I think treating depression and anxiety should just be considered in the same way that we consider treatment for your, for your tremor. Um, so tremor is caused by not enough dopamine, depression is caused by not enough serotonin, um, and, and, and treatments and medical treatments or non-medical treatments like exercise or like therapy uh, can really help improve your quality of life. Um, have people here seen the movie Awakenings? Okay, so, so if people haven't seen the movie Awakenings, it's really a, a wonderful film about the discovery of levodopa. Um, I bring this up in the context of apathy uh, uh, because it has some, I think, very dramatic examples. So in regards to movement, there are two systems in the brain that are important for controlling movement. Uh, so one system in the brain is important for controlling internally generated actions, so things that are, I have an internal goal and I want to do something. And then there's a system in the brain that's important for reacting to things that are happening in the outside world. And there's a scene in Awakenings where people in this uh, uh, institution are stiff and they can't move. And then when Robert Williams, who happens to be the physician in this case, throws a the ball, they're able to move and catch it. 
Um, and so we use these kinds of tricks for motor symptoms. So for instance, if people have freezing of gait, if I put my foot out, people can step over that foot. Uh, people can use a laser cane and step over that laser line. Sometimes having a metronome or music can help cue people. Um, and so we can use these external cues to kind of trick the system to be able to do things that we want to do. Um, so the same thing is true for apathy. So if people have severe apathy, they're not going to wake up at 5 in the morning and write down a list of all the things that they're going to do that day. But what can happen is that if we set expectations and have habits and have routines, a lot of times people can follow that external structure better than they'll be able to internally generate it. Um, so that's one thing that's important to think about when we're thinking about apathy. The other thing that I think is really important is understanding that apathy is part of Parkinson's and that we, meaning that physicians and families and caregivers, may need to change our expectations. Um, and that's one of the things that's really challenging about non-motor symptoms like apathy and fatigue is a lot of times uh, we kind of have this mindset that somebody should be able to just overcome their apathy or their fatigue and if they don't do it, they're lazy. Uh, but that's really not the case. These are uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease and we wouldn't tell somebody, you know, um, you know, stop freezing or stop moving slowly and expect them to be able to do that like that. Um, and so changing expectations and making sure that we treat uh, patients with Parkinson's who are suffering with these symptoms with compassion. And a lot of times when families are able to adjust their expectations and realize that this person who was a CEO and a type A personality is no longer that person anymore, uh, that it makes it a lot less stressful for both the patient and for their family. Um, things that you can do about it. Um, so this, and actually one of the tragedies with depression and apathy and, and anxiety is that the number one reason that people have treatment failures for these symptoms is that they are not recognized at all. And so over half of people with Parkinson's and depression do not get treatment because their doctor never talked to them about it and they never got tried on an antidepressant or another therapy. Um, so it's really important that you talk to your doctor about it because not all doctors um, are trained to uh, assess for these things. Um, it's important to talk to your family and friends about it. Um, one of the things that really makes depression and anxiety worse is social isolation. So it's important to try to break that barrier and try to break that stigma. Um, exercise, again, is important for, for both anxiety and for depression. And therapy, psychotherapy or counseling can be really powerful. When it comes to therapy, I think it's important that you find a good match with a therapist. Um, there's some literature for cognitive behavioral therapy, but I think the most important thing is really finding a type of therapy and a therapist that works well for you. And if you go and see a therapist and you have a bad experience, that doesn't mean that therapy is not good. It just means that that's not the best therapist for you, and it's worthwhile to try to find somebody else. Um, I don't know if people have read the book The Noonday Demon, which is a, a great book about depression, but in that book, um, I think the author, I think it was on his 11th therapist that he really found a good match and found somebody that he could work with. So it's really important to be patient and find somebody that you like working with. And the last thing is medications. Um, antidepressants can be helpful for depression and anxiety in people with Parkinson's. And I think they're actually sometimes easier or more effective than in people who have depression and anxiety without Parkinson's because in Parkinson's disease, it's almost always due to this neurochemical deficit. And so people with Parkinson's really respond well to medications. The other thing about medications that's important to know about is that if people have apathy and no depression, that some of the antidepressants can actually make apathy worse. And so certain SSRIs, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, can sometimes make apathy worse. And I've had patients who were seeing a psychiatrist and they kept having their antidepressant increase and their depression seemed to be getting worse. But when I talked to that person, uh, they were not sad at all. They didn't have any symptoms of depression. They had apathy. And so we got them off of the antidepressant and they actually, uh, their apathy improved a little bit. It didn't go back to normal, but it, it was definitely better than they were on a high dose of antidepressant. Okay, um, so the autonomic nervous system is the automatic part of our nervous system. So it's the part that controls our heart rate and our blood pressure and digestion, um, all the things that we don't think about or don't like to think about uh, because they happen automatically. And when they don't happen automatically, we might think a lot about them. Um, so some of the symptoms of uh, autonomic nervous system dysfunction include constipation. Um, and that's a, a common symptom in Parkinson's. It oftentimes uh, comes up a long time before people have any motor symptoms. Uh, urinary urgency, uh, which is just a way of saying that when you have to pee, you really have to pee. Um, low blood pressure. Uh, sexual dysfunction. Um, sweating is a symptom that uh, can come up for some people with Parkinson's. And it's one of these symptoms that people oftentimes don't know, is this for my Parkinson's or something else? Um, and then people can also have problems with extra mucus, uh, kind of post-nasal drip, and, and drooling or excess saliva. 
So these are things that are all common and, and can be part of Parkinson's. And this is important to know about because these symptoms can range from things that are annoying, um, like in the case of having extra mucus, to things that are life-threatening, like as, as in the case of having low blood pressure. Um, these things can affect quality of life in a number of ways, from uh, discomfort to social embarrassment. For instance, having uh, uh, drooling can be uh, quite embarrassing. Uh, to intimacy with your life partner. And so when we talk about sexual dysfunction, this can really interfere with your uh, primary relationship and relationship with your spouse. And it's important, again, to know that these symptoms are treatable, and I'll talk about uh, things that we can do about them. Uh, one of the things, and particularly this time of year, that I think is important to know about is orthostatic blood pressure. So orthostatic blood pressure is not your resting blood pressure. It means what's your change in blood pressure when you go from lying down to standing up. And so normally when we're lying down, uh, we have plenty of blood going to our brain, and then when we stand up, our blood vessels are supposed to tighten to keep the blood out of our feet and allow it to go to our brain. And if we are either dehydrated, so we don't have enough fluid to make it to our head, or our nervous systems aren't working because of Parkinson's, and so our blood vessels aren't squeezing as tightly, when we stand up, we may not get enough blood to our head. And some of the symptoms of that can include lightheadedness, uh, it can also include headache, fatigue, uh, problems with balance or falls. And it's really around this time of year uh, that I oftentimes will see a lot of patients who come into clinic and say that their Parkinson's just all of a sudden is not as out of control. And a lot of times that's because the weather has heated up and they haven't been doing a good job of hydrating and so now their symptoms appear magnified. Um, so that's an important thing to do. And again, uh, remember that you need to get your blood pressure check lying down for two minutes and then standing up for two minutes. So just getting your blood pressure checked when you're seated does not tell you if you have orthostatic blood pressure. And it may look normal when you're seated down, but if it drops by 20 points, it really tells you that there's a, a problem. Um, things that you can do about it includes tracking your blood pressure. The other thing to know with this is that sometimes people have a history of hypertension and that when um, they've been taking a high blood pressure pill their whole life, but Parkinson's is lowering their blood pressure now. And so sometimes people can get off of their blood pressure medications and that the blood pressure medications may actually be causing them problems uh, such as falls. And actually I just saw somebody on Friday who got off their blood pressure medicines and is now having a much easier time with bending over to pick things up and with stairs than he did when he was taking that medicine. Um, we talk about bowel regimen, and what this means is that you're doing the same thing every day to keep your bowels regular. Um, and that, and the, kind of the focus of that is, is fluids, so staying well hydrated, and we usually recommend that people try to get about eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day. Um, if you get half of that, that's pretty good. I have some people who drink maybe eight ounces of water a day. It's not uncommon. It's also important to know that caffeine, even though it can help some non-motor symptoms, does not count as hydration because it's a diuretic and you'll actually pee out more than you drink. So really important to get some water. Um, and, and we try to do the same thing every day. You can also add other things like prunes and prune juice and flaxseed. And the idea is that you want to keep your bowels regular rather than wait until it's been five days without a bowel movement and try to catch up. Um, there are medications that can help with drooling, uh, with mucus, and with bladder control. Um, and we can talk about those more later when we have time for questions. And then sexual dysfunction uh, can occur from a lot of different reasons. So it can occur because of erectile dysfunction or problems with lubrication. It can occur because people don't have the same amount of movement in their hips. Um, it can occur because of psychological issues. So for instance, a caregiver may feel more like a nurse than like they're a wife and that there are problems on a psychological level with intimacy. And so all these things I think are worth talking about and worth addressing to try to um, allow sex to be better, which is really, a, I think, an important part of life. Uh, visual symptoms. So uh, these include problems with reading, um, problems with night vision and driving, uh, visual illusions. And an example of visual illusions, it seems like everywhere I talk, they always have very loud carpets. And so it's a good, good example. So if you're looking at the carpet and you think you see a spider or a snake, and then you move your eyes and you see that it's, it's just a loud carpet, um, then uh, that's an illusion. Uh, a hallucination is that if you see, uh, for instance, a rabbit or a dog up here, and there's not a rabbit or a dog up here, just so you can uh, be clear, um, th that would be an example of a hallucination. So it's having a form figure and it doesn't necessarily go, go away when you look at it. Uh, with hallucinations, uh, they, they're kind of come in two forms. So people can have benign hallucinations where they know that what they're seeing is not real. And people can also have hallucinations where they don't recognize that what they're seeing is not real. 
Um, so it's important to know about. Uh, so visual problems can affect your safety, and, and I and other people have published that visual symptoms are actually one of the reasons that people with Parkinson's may have driving accidents. So really important to make sure that we um, target that. Um, these symptoms can be side effects of medications, and particularly dopamine agonist medications like Nupro and Mirapex and Requip uh, can cause visual uh, hallucinations as a side effect. Um, and these symptoms are treatable. So things that you can do about it, um, if you're having problems with reading in particular, um, so Parkinson's disease can affect the eye muscles, and in particular it affects the ability of the eyes to pull in what we call convergence. Um, and there are prisms that can be used to help reduce that eye stream. Um, uh, medication adjustments can help hallucinations, and oftentimes my first step will be to get rid of medications that are contributing to hallucinations, and then we can add other medications that can help suppress uh, hallucinations if needed. The last thing to know for caregivers and families is that if people have hallucinations and they are not bothersome, um, in fact, a lot of uh, my patients have hallucinations that are pleasant. Um, I have uh, several patients with hallucinatory cats. Um, who, they, who they really like, or children that come to visit them. And so the, we don't need to get rid of hallucinations if they are not causing a problem. Um, so I'll kind of wrap up with some other important stuff. And this says here, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? <laughs> um, and so really just wanting to hammer home, you know, a thing that you're going to hear again and again today of how important exercise is for Parkinson's. And one of the things that I emphasize also when I start medications with people is that if you're taking a medication and you're sitting on your couch all day, you are not getting the benefit of that medication. Uh, the role of medications is really to be able to get up and to exercise and be active. Um, and that's more important than the medicine itself. The most important thing is being active and trying to stay independent. Um, so some of the other symptoms include pain. And this is another one of these things that kind of falls into this middle ground. So, so pain in Parkinson's is pretty common. About two-thirds of people with Parkinson's will have pain related to their Parkinson's. And this is oftentimes not acknowledged or recognized. And I will see a couple patients a year who have unnecessary shoulder or neck surgery uh, for pain that probably came from their Parkinson's disease uh, but was attributed to orthopedic problems. Impulse control disorders or problems with uh, gambling, uh, pornography, uh, internet shopping, things like that, that can result as a side effect from medications. And in particular, medications like Nupro and Mirapex and Requip can cause these symptoms. I always tell people about it when I start the medication uh, because when sp uh, people oftentimes do not think about gambling as a side effect uh, for medications. Um, and when we stop the medication, the gambling may go away, but the house and the wife and the money usually don't come back. So it's important to recognize those things and stop it before it happens. Osteoporosis is thinning of the bones, and uh, that can be a, a cause of fractures, and again, a, a reason to start vitamin D and calcium. And then melanoma is a type of skin cancer uh, that is uh, more common in people with Parkinson's disease and a reason to get um, skin checks. Um, so it's important to know about because pain, again, can affect a lot of things. It affects mood and sleep and day-to-day and -day function. Um, and there are treatments for it depending on the cause of pain. Um, so we talked about frozen shoulder and the importance of doing full movements around the, the shoulders and the hips and the hand muscles. Um, pain can be caused from dystonia, so cramping of muscles, and there are treatments for that. Uh, pain can be caused by neuropathy, which can be a burning or shooting pain. Um, it's important to try to prevent bone fractures and skin cancer. Um, and then also important to know that your medications can cost you your, your house and marriage. Um, so. Um, just to kind of sum up, and then we'll go get into uh, questions. So some of the take-home messages. Uh, so one is, is to get your memory tested, and to do that on a regular basis, um, and to get that tested uh, by someone who's uh, doing MOCA or neuropsychological testing. Um, it's important to talk to your doctor about non-motor symptoms you're experiencing, which could be mood, problems with energy or sleep, problems with pain, constipation, things that they're not going to be able to see in their usual exam. If you're having problems with fatigue, really important to get your balance or, or balance to get your uh, blood pressure checked, uh, particularly in the summer months, and to stay well hydrated. Um, it's important to get your skin and your bones checked on an annual basis by your primary care physician. Uh, medications are something that it's important to look at, and they can cause problems like memory issues, sleep problems, and hallucinations. So really trying to be on as few medications as possible is generally a good idea. Uh, getting plenty of fluids and fiber to help with both your bowel health as well as helping um, uh, with energy and blood pressure. And lastly is to stay active physically, mentally, and socially. 
And so it is now noon, and so we will take about 15 minutes to go through questions, and I'm happy to answer questions related to anything that I talked about, but I'm also happy to try to answer questions that you have uh, about other aspects of Parkinson's. A really wonderful presentation on many of the non-motor aspects of this disease. So we've got, as Dr. Kluger said, about 15 minutes, and we have our two roving microphones again. Got a question over here already. Um, we're not able to get amantadine in pill form anymore, or at least not recently. Is there another pill that will replace it? Um, yes, yeah, so the question is, is uh, I guess, and I don't know if this is a British Columbia thing or, or the difficulty is getting amantadine, a uh, Canadian problem. There, there, is, there is another medication which is probably even harder to get. I think it's called rimantadine, which is related to amantadine. Uh, oh, okay. So, so I was told that you could get it in liquid form and there's not, not really a big difference between taking it as a tablet or a liquid. Um, you know, uh, so if you could take it as a liquid, I would just substitute it. But there's not really any other medications in that particular category that you could easily substitute for it. So if you're taking amantadine for dyskinesias, uh, there's really not another medication that you can replace it with. Where can you get your memory tested? Okay. Uh, so, so the question is, where can you get your memory tested? Um, if you are seeing a neurologist or a movement disorder specialist, um, they should be able to and they should be familiar with something called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. If they are not, uh, there's a website, www.moca.org, and it's freely available. It's actually freely available, I think, now in 35 different languages. It has instructions for how to do it, and a physician or a nurse can give it. Um, you can also get testing with a neuropsychologist, which would be doing a more detailed level of testing. Uh, the MOCA takes about 10 to 15 minutes, and it's really more of a screening test. And if there are, you know, more uh, questions about it, then getting neuropsychological testing or seeing a neuropsychologist would be the next step. I'm just wondering if you've ever encountered anybody who's experienced hallucinations with scent. Uh, so the, the question is, have I encountered anyone who's experienced hallucinations with scent or um, olfactory or, or uh, hallucinations? And, and so the most common hallucinations we see with Parkinson's disease are visual, and that's actually different than schizophrenia where the most common is auditory. Uh, but in Parkinson's disease, people can have olfactory hallucinations where they have smells. Uh, sometimes, uh, this is something to make sure that is not uh, the case, is that olfactory or smell hallucinations are actually more common in people with epilepsy. Uh, so to just make sure that's not going on. But people can also have auditory hallucinations in Parkinson's tactile hallucinations, so feeling like there's creepy, crawly things, or what we call presence hallucinations, which is just a sense that there's maybe somebody behind you, but there's nobody there. And so those are all types of hallucinations that we can see with Parkinson's. Um, do you see the, the um, loss of energy or fatigue solely related to sleep disorders, or if a person is sleeping fine but noticing qualitative differences in energy? What are the, what's that related to? Yeah, okay. so that's a, a, a good question. So the, the question is, is, uh, is fatigue and Parkinson's disease just related to problems with sleep? Um, and the answer to that question is, is no, that it's not. Um, uh, and there's been some good studies. In fact, if people are interested, um, we just published a, a paper on case definition criteria for Parkinson's disease-related fatigue. And part of the reason we published this paper was to make it easier uh, for people to get disability related to fatigue and Parkinson's disease and to help promote more research on it. Uh, but most people who experience fatigue and not sleepiness do not have a sleep disorder. Um, and there are some other reversible causes, so thyroid disease, low testosterone, low blood pressure. But we think that for the majority of people with Parkinson's that fatigue is a primary aspect of Parkinson's disease. And that's something that I'm, we're doing research on right now is to try to better understand um, what causes fatigue in Parkinson's. In terms of things you can do about it, uh, the two things that I found the most helpful, so one is sometimes stimulant medications like Ritalin can help if people are really having problems with mental fatigue and concentration and attention. The other thing is strength training uh, and doing gradual strength training may be helpful because the idea is, is that you're building your capacity. So we have a model of fatigue that fatigue is really related to if I don't 
uh, you're giving out a certain amount of work and you're getting a less back. And so if you have atrophy of your muscles and you're weaker, it's going to take you more effort and energy to do less work. And so if you can do progressive resistance exercises, that can sometimes help with fatigue. Uh, yeah, I think fatigue and energy are kind of flip sides of each other. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, over here. Over here. Yep. Yes. Um, the, does deep brain stimulation help any of these non-motor functions? Or yeah. So, so the question is, does deep brain stimulation help any of the non-motor symptoms? Um, and, and so deep brain stimulation, uh, there's pretty good evidence that it can help with sleep. And that's one of the things that people often will comment on after they get DBS is that they're sleeping better. And that's probably because, you know, we talked about uh, Parkinson's being a 24-7 disease. And so they're able to sleep more comfortably and they're not woken up by off symptoms in the middle of the night. Um, Parkinson's does not seem to help fatigue. Uh, Parkinson's disease uh, does not really seem to help mood. And in fact, people who are having depression or anxiety need to be careful about DBS because there have been a few suicides in patients after DBS. Uh, Parkinson's does not help thinking or memory, and in fact can make some aspects of those worse. So it's important if you're thinking about DBS to make sure you work with an experienced team and you get your thinking and memory tested beforehand, uh, because that is one of the risks of DBS is to get worsening of thinking and memory. A two two uh, phase question. Number one, the risks of uh, Tylenol uh, with arthritis, and secondly how to differentiate between uh, pain in the shoulder or the elbow between arthritis and uh, Parkinson's? Yeah. Uh, so, so the qu first part of the question was about safety of Tylenol. Um, and, and Tylenol itself is safe in Parkinson's disease. So, so with Tylenol, you want to limit the total amount of Tylenol you get in a day to 4,000 milligrams or less because it can affect the liver. Um, but, but Tylenol by itself uh, is okay. Tylenol PM, so Tylenol plus Benadryl, and some people can affect thinking and memory. Uh, the second part of the question is, how do you tell the difference between Parkinson's pain and arthritis? Um, and that can sometimes be really tricky. Um, and the two actually can go together. So Parkinson's disease can make arthritis worse. Um, so arthritis just means pain in the joints. Um, and so you can have wear and tear in the joints. Sometimes patients will get x-rays of their hands or shoulder to see if there's bone on bone or other forms of arthritis. Um, so a lot of times I'll work with a primary care doctor or a rheumatologist so that we can sort those things out. Um, but people with Parkinson's can also have worse osteoarthritis or arthritic pain, so it's not really an either-or thing. Um, and the arthritis, whether it's caused by Parkinson's or not, still needs to be addressed. Yep. All right. Um, this question is about strategy. Uh, you spoke about the benefits of exercise to overcome fatigue. Yeah. Well, the strategy as to how one does that without nagging, it would be very helpful <laughs> yeah. for you to introduce a strategy that, yep. that, would, that might work. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. So, so the question is about uh, strategies for getting more exercise. Um, and so I talked about, and I'm sure you've heard lots of times today, of how important exercise is. Um, and for some people who love exercise, that's very easy. Uh, for other people who don't like exercise or who have significant apathy or significant fatigue, it can be pretty difficult. Um, so some strategies that can work for some people um, can include, um, so, so with fatigue we talk about energy management strategies, and, and the idea behind that is that you have a fixed amount of energy per day, and so you need to allocate things across the day, and so if your best energy is in the morning, then that might be a good time to do exercise. Um, so that's one kind of strategy. A second strategy is to try to find things that are fun and enjoyable. Uh, so if you hate uh, treadmills or hate exercise bikes, that's probably not the best exercise for you. So I always encourage people to do things that they really enjoy doing and are fun. Uh, there's other ways to make exercise painless. Uh, so for instance, putting an exercise bike in front of the television and then just having you know, a period of time where you're kind of doing exercise or you're taking a walk together and talking about things or listening to music. Uh, there's also a, kind of an increasing number of uh, fun classes like uh, dance and boxing um, and things like that that can uh, help people um, do better with exercise. Yep. Hi, could you uh, address dystonia and treatment? Yeah. Please. Uh, so, so the question is about dystonia, which is one of the causes of pain that was up on the slide. So what dystonia is, is an abnormal contraction of muscles. And in people with Parkinson's disease, the most common places we see that are in the feet. Um, so it could be that toes are curling in or pulling up, uh, sometimes in the calf. 
uh, sometimes in the hand, sometimes in the muscles of the neck. Um, usually the place I will start if people have dystonia is to make sure that their Parkinson's is well treated because a lot of times when people get on an adequate dose of Cinemat or Levodopa, uh, the, the dystonia will melt away. Um, stretching can sometimes be helpful and massage. Um, Botox injections can be helpful if people have very focal dystonia involving specific parts of the body. Uh, sometimes occupational therapy or a physical therapist can be helpful or a podiatrist can be helpful to do inserts or things that can help make the foot or hand or other things more comfortable. Uh, there's a rumor in Colorado and other places in the U.S., I don't know if it's here, uh, that putting a bar of soap under the covers uh, can help with uh, cramps and pain. I don't know why that would be the case, but I've heard that from, from multiple sources. Um, another kind of quick and easy trick that I'll use is taking extra magnesium before bedtime or tonic water with quinine uh, can sometimes help with uh, cramps during the night. Yep. Okay. Something that my husband has found in his blood, he's carrying Lyme and Bartonella, and in talking to some naturopaths in Canada Lyme, they said that they're finding almost 100% of people with Parkinson's also have Lyme. Have you heard of anything like that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, it's, so the uh, question is, is um, I guess uh, this woman has been working with a naturopath um, who is claiming that, you know, in, in their experience, 100% of Parkinson's cases are related to Lyme or Bartonella. Um, I can address this more this afternoon. I'm talking about complementary and alternative medicine, uh, but just briefly. Um, the, the idea, so, so Lyme disease uh, can be a cause of neurologic disorders, and Lyme can definitely be chronic, uh, but it's oftentimes overdiagnosed, and it's kind of controversial, and I don't think there is any good evidence to support uh, that the majority of Parkinson's disease is, is related to chronic Lyme disease. Um, and I think this relates, and there's some other things like this and, uh, regarding heavy metals um, that, that are, I think, more um, not evidence-based um, and, and more kind of mythology uh, than really scientifically based. Hi, I was just wondering about the um, amintadine. I was trying to get some yesterday and they don't have the capsule, but they have the liquid. And does that work as well? Because the, the pharmacist said to me that he doesn't know how to dose it. What's that, with the mantidine? It was the mantidine liquid that you were asking about. Yeah, he, he didn't really know what to do with the liquid. And um, why is it that some people have so much dyskinesia like I do, but I go, I cut back on my drugs, and then it just wears off so fast. Like I can get two hours if I don't uh, have my full dose. If I have my full dose, yep. I get like three hours. Okay, uh, so, so two questions. So, so one, uh, so the liquid amantadine would be dosed the same as the pill amantadine. And so a, a pretty common dose would be 100 milligrams with breakfast and 100 milligrams um, around lunchtime. Uh, we do have some patients who are on higher doses, but that'd be a, a place to start. Uh, the second question, which is a little trickier, is uh, why do some people have more problems with dyskinesias than others? Um, and w one part of that is that people who are younger with Parkinson's disease uh, are more prone to developing dyskinesias. And part of the theory behind uh, why that may be is that people actually with healthier brains who have more neuronal connections may actually be more prone to developing dyskinesias because part of the idea is that dyskinesias is kind of an abnormal form of motor learning. And so you're basically forming more connections uh, than are actually necessary and that's what's driving dyskinesias, but we don't totally understand why some people develop dyskinesias more than others, just like we don't totally understand why some people have more tremor uh, than, than other patients. Uh, uh, and then there was a, a comment about eating sugar, and, and again, we can kind of talk about diet, um, so I'm going to talk about complementary medicines this afternoon, um, and, and we can go into, you know, diet and sugar and other things like that. Yeah. One last question. Yeah, with the, with the need to know more, uh, can you recommend a good um, reading material on Parkinson's? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it sounds like. Yeah. Go ahead. So um, we do have an incredible resource at Parkinson's Society BC. All of our material on our website is also available in print. The lady who's standing right beside you is one of our key uh, programs and services coordinators. If you call us. 
if you're not computer fluent, just call us, have a chat with them. They'll put together a whole package of materials. And we have a wonderful booklet called Understanding and Moving Forward with Parkinson's Disease that you can get here today at our, I think, yes? No. So you have but, to call us. You have to call us for that one. Yes, you do. It's quite a heavy resource. But also, um, we have an extend not ex well extensive library loaning uh, lending library that you can access. But I don't know if there are specific books, Benzi, that you would recommend. Um, yeah, I, I would just add. Uh, so, so other resources that I'm uh, familiar with. That um, yeah, so one, one is the the Parkinson's Foundation, which used to be the National Parkinson's Foundation in the U.S. Um, has a number of resources on specific topics, including caregiving, including several of the non-motor symptoms. Uh, there's a number of, of really well-written uh, books on different aspects of Parkinson's disease. So if you go to Amazon and put in Parkinson's, you could look at, I think there's now about 20 books uh, that cover different aspects of Parkinson's disease. Um, another resource, which may be less familiar in Canada, is the Davis Finney Foundation. And they're actually coming up to, uh, to Toronto in October, uh, but they have some uh, nice materials about living well with Parkinson's disease. And they also have a really nice exercise DVD uh, for people with Parkinson's. Thank you. Thank All you right. again, Dr. Okay. Thank you.